You're listening to A New Beginning with Greg Laurie, a podcast made possible by Harvest Partners, helping people everywhere know God. Visit our website and learn more about Harvest Partners at harvest.org. Jesus came to this earth to die for the sins of the world. But his disciples did not get that because it was lost in translation. In real time, it was a surprising message to comprehend. Today on A New Beginning, Pastor Greg Laurie gives us perspective on God's plan and the Lord's sacrifice. One day he will rule as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But before Christ would wear a crown, he would first have to bear a cross. This is the day when the lost are found. This is the day for a new beginning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Again you hear all the angels are singing. This is the day, the day when life begins. Pastor Greg Laurie calls his series in the book of Mark, The Gospel for Busy People. It's God's full plan of salvation, explained and applied to our lives today. And on this edition of A New Beginning, we hear Jesus explain that full plan of salvation to disciples who are hearing it unfold for the first time. It's a fascinating discussion where Jesus polls the disciples on perhaps the most significant question of the ages, a question that carries eternal consequences. In this message, I want to talk to you from, again, the Gospel of Mark. We're in a series there. And the title of my message is Lost in Translation. So grab your Bible and turn to Mark chapter 8. Again, the title is Lost in Translation. I heard about an older couple. They were celebrating 50 years of marriage together. Now the problem was the wife was getting a little hard of hearing. And the husband announced in front of family and friends, To his wife, my dear wife, after 50 years, I have found you tried and true. Again, she couldn't hear very well. She said, what? He said, my dear wife, after 50 years, I have found you tried and true. And then she shot back, well, after 50 years, I'm tired of you too. (laughs) Now there's a little communication breakdown there. You know, there's a lot of American companies that have tried to offer their products overseas, but sometimes there's a language barrier that has to be overcome. It's called something getting lost in translation. As an example, the Parker Pen Company was expanding their ballpoint line to Mexico. And uh, their slogan was, it won't leak in your pocket and embarrass you. But the problem was they didn't fully understand how it would come out in Spanish. And instead it was translated to say, on billboards, this pen will not leak in your pocket and impregnate you. (laughs) A little different than intended. In Italy, a campaign for Schweppes tonic water translated into Schweppes toilet water. (laughs) Needless to say, not a lot of people wanted to drink toilet water. Jolly Green Giant, you remember them? Ho, ho, ho. And their slogan, the Jolly Green Giant, they tried to market in the Arabic market. And instead it came out to Intimidating Green Ogre. (laughs) Have you tried some of those beans from the Intimidating Green Ogre? In Taiwan, the translation of the Pepsi slogan, Come Alive with the Pepsi Generation, instead came out to say, Pepsi will bring your ancestors back from the dead. Now, depending on what ancestors those were, maybe that's a promising thing, maybe not so. Clairol tried to market its mystic curling iron in Germany, and instead of it saying mystic, it said manure stick. (laughs) Not a lot of German ladies were all that excited about using a manure stick. (laughs) In China, Kentucky Fried Chicken took their slogan, figure looking good, and instead it came out in Chinese as, eat your fingers off. (laughs) It gives a whole new meaning to chicken fingers, doesn't it? And finally, Scandinavian vacuum cleaner manufacturer Electrolux used the following in an American ad campaign. So they came over to America and used this phrase, nothing sucks like an Electrolux. (laughs) Yeah, something is lost in translation. Well, guess what? 
Jesus seemed to have this issue with his own disciples. They did not understand why he had come to this earth in the first place. Jesus came to this earth to die for the sins of the world. But his disciples did not get that because it was lost in translation. Their hope and their belief was he was going to establish an earthly kingdom then and there. Their hope and belief was he was going to drive the Romans out who were occupying the land. In fact, you remember after he fed the 5,000, that was his most popular miracle to date, the people wanted to make Jesus king by force. And what is that all about? That means that they wanted to make him the king so he would drive out Rome. They didn't understand that that is not why he had primarily come. Now look, one day Christ will come back and establish his kingdom. One day he will rule as king of kings and lord of lords. But before Christ would wear a crown, he would first have to bear a cross. Now, as we come to our text here in Mark chapter 8, his ministry in Galilee is coming to a close. This is a transitional moment in his ministry. And for the first time, he's going to speak very clearly and in great detail about why he has come. Uh, and he also asks a powerful question that we still need to answer today. Let's look at our text. Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 27. Jesus and his disciples of Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. As they were walking along, he asked them, Who do people say that I am? Well, they replied, Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. And some say you're one of the other prophets. Then Jesus asks them, But who do you say that I am? Peter replies, you are the Messiah. And Jesus warned them to not tell anyone about him. Now this is the most important question of all. Jesus asks this question, who do men say that I am? And this is a question we almost ultimately answer. I'm gonna tell you the answer now. Ultimately, everyone will say, Jesus Christ is the Lord. Every Christian will say it. Every non-Christian will say it. Every atheist will say it. Every agnostic will say it. Every person will ultimately say, Jesus is Lord. You'll say, no, Greg, you're wrong about that. Not everybody believes. Well, I didn't say they would necessarily say it during their lives on earth. But one day when they stand before God Almighty, they will acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians 2.10 says, At the name of Jesus Christ, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now here's a big thing we don't want to miss. Where did Jesus ask this question? This question, who do men say that I am? Where did he ask it? He asked it at a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now we could breeze by that and miss its significance altogether. Caesarea Philippi was named after the Greek god Pan. So basically in a place of paganism and false belief, Jesus Christ asks his disciples to make a stand. You know it's one thing to say, oh Jesus is Lord when we're with our Christian friends. Oh Jesus is Lord when we're at church and singing praise to him. But will you say Jesus is Lord when you're gathered together with family from out of town? Will you say Jesus is Lord when you're at work? Will you say Jesus is Lord when you're out and about in life? See, it's one thing to make a stand with fellow believers. It's another thing to make a stand in our culture. Jesus said this, if a person is ashamed of me, and my message, I the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when I return in my glory and in the glory of my Father with the holy angels. Don't be ashamed of Christ. Speak up for Him. Pastor Greg Laurie will have the second half of his message in just a moment. Hearing about listeners who find Jesus because of Pastor Greg's teaching is so encouraging. Hi, Pastor Greg. In 1996, I accepted Jesus at a Promise Keepers event in Oakland, California, where you invited me to come down and accept Christ. It's because of your story that I found Jesus and am now part of your life because you helped lead me to the Lord. Because of that, my three sons are saved and most of my grandchildren as well. 
Your faithfulness in sharing the truth has changed my whole family. We're so grateful to hear of the changed lives through Harvest Ministries. And if you have a story to tell, would you consider letting us know? If so, email Pastor Greg, greg at harvest.org. Do it today while you're thinking about it. Again, that's greg at harvest.org. Well, Pastor Greg is presenting a message today called Lost in Translation. Jesus is addressing his disciples in Caesarea Philippi, as recorded in Mark chapter 8. So Jesus asked them, who do men say that I am? Basically the Lord saying, hey guys, what's the word on the street? What are people actually saying about me right now? Here's the question. Did Jesus know what the word on the street was? Did he know what people thought about him and what they said about him? Absolutely. In fact, he would call people out for their thoughts while he was engaging them. Why do you think this in your heart, he would say to someone. So he was aware. But the reason he asked this question of his disciples is he's giving them a test. And why does a teacher give a test? Answer, to see if the class is learning the material. They'd seen Jesus perform his miracles. They'd see Jesus walk on the water. They'd seen Jesus heal leprosy and drive out demons from people and even raise the dead. Did they really understand who he was yet? Apparently not. Because they replied, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah. Still others say you're one of the prophets. That was not the right answer. But Simon Peter, known for his outspokenness, got it. Peter says in verse 30, you are the Messiah. In Matthew's version of this story, he has Peter saying, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You're not Elijah. You're not John the Baptist. You're not even a mere prophet. You are the very Son of God. See, Jesus was not a mere man. He was not just one of the prophets. He was God coming to us in human flesh. God had a face. It was God with skin on walking among us as the Lord entered our world. The birth of Jesus Christ was the most momentous event that has ever occurred in the history of the planet. It was the eternal God confining himself to a single cell and being born of a woman in order to be the savior of the world. God literally became a fetus. And then in this earth-shaking event, Simon Peter got it. You, he says to Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And in Matthew's version of the story, Matthew 16, Jesus says, blessed are you. Simon Bar-Jonah, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I say to you, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. Can you imagine how Peter felt? Singled out by Jesus, hey Peter, guess what? You didn't just come up with that on your own. My father gave that thought to you. That's where the inspiration for those words came. Man, Peter was just thinking, this is so awesome. I'm being singled out and complimented by Jesus. But now the Lord continues on and he drops what could best be described as a bombshell. Look at Mark chapter eight, verse 31. Then Jesus began to teach him that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and three days later rise again. Notice the detail in those words. He, he laid it out. Guys, here's who's going to betray me. It's going to be the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And I will be killed and I will rise again in three days. He spoke plainly about this. Now look at this. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And when Jesus turned and looked at the disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Stop there. By the way, this is the first time Jesus ever talked specifically, clearly, and I might even add graphically, about the fact that he was going to die. I don't even think they heard the he'll be raised on the third day part. They just heard he was going to die. I don't think I'm overstating it when this was really shocking to them. He was effectively saying, I, Jesus, 
who you've given up everything to follow. I'm going to be murdered in cold blood. I'm gonna be taken from you. And they're thinking, how could that be part of any plan? You're the Messiah. You're supposed to establish your kingdom here and now. How is this gonna be part of something good for you to be taken and murdered? And in fact, we've given up everything to follow you, Jesus. And, and we've made these great sacrifices. And so Peter thought, since he's the guy who got an inspired thought from the Father, that he would sort of set Jesus straight. And we read in verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And by the way, in the original language, that implies it was done over and over again. I mean, I'm trying to imagine this. Peter says, Jesus, come here for a second. Buddy, listen, come on, man, what are you doing? I rebuke you, Jesus. You cannot do this. He's rebuking God Almighty. I mean, this is insane. And Jesus listens to him. And then Jesus turns and rebukes Peter. <laughs> now we say, boy, I, that, I can't believe Peter did that. Oh, excuse me. Have you ever given God advice before? You know, the Bible asks the question to Romans eleven thirty four: Who has known the mind of the Lord? And who has been his counselor? Well, I would say the answer to that question is, I have. <laughs> you have. And we'll say to the Lord, now, Lord, I've got this all figured out. I met this girl. This is the one I'm supposed to marry. So you need to reveal this to her. And, and Lord, here's my business plan. And, and you need to bless it. And here's the way I'm going to do my ministry. And here's what you do to, uh, need to do next. I'm not asking God for wisdom. I'm not praying about direction. I'm making my plan and asking God to bless it. And the question is, who's in charge here? And who is leading who? Jesus was in charge. Peter says, no, bad plan. I veto it. I reject it. Jesus says, I rebuke you, Peter. The devil gave you that thought to deter me from this course. Listen, it was always God's plan for Christ to die. I already mentioned that. We read in Revelation 13, 8, Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. What does that mean? That means before there was a planet called Earth, before there was a garden called Eden, before there was a couple known as Adam and Eve who ate of the forbidden fruit, God knew man would blow it. The sin of Adam and Eve did not come as a surprise or shock to the Lord. He knew it would happen. It, it was just the Lord knowing the future. And so he said, I already have a plan. And it's not a backup plan. It is the main plan. My son is gonna come to this earth and be born in a manger, live a perfect life, and is gonna die on the cross for the sin of the world because of the sin that will be committed there in the Garden of Eden. And the result is sin spread through the human race. And this reminds us that the devil was trying to stop Jesus from reaching his objective. Again, what was that objective? It was to die on the cross. Don't forget when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, the devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and he said, all of this is mine and I can give it to whomever I choose and if you will worship me, all of this will be yours. The devil tried to stop Jesus from reaching his objective way back at the beginning of our Lord's ministry. Remember that Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. The Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. The Holy Spirit came upon him in the form of a dove. And we read immediately Jesus was driven into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And among those temptations, the devil said to Jesus, Here's all the kingdoms of the world. They all belong to me and I can give them to you if you will simply worship me. Jesus replied, it is written, you shall worship the Lord God and him only shall you serve. What was that all about? The devil is saying, allow me to loosely paraphrase, Jesus, we both know why you're here. We both know you're gonna go die on a cross for the sin of the world. And I'm gonna make you an offer now. I'm gonna give you what you've come for. I know you've come to purchase back that which was lost in the Garden of Eden. I'll give it to you on a silver platter if you'll give me the momentary pleasure of worshiping me. And Jesus rejected that. Jesus knew he had to go to the cross. And this is a reminder that the devil often hits us as Christians in the beginning and at the end of our lives. In the middle too, but you remember when you were a brand new believer, some of the first attacks that came your way were 
the devil challenging what had happened. You had that little thought in your mind, am I really a Christian? Did Christ really forgive me? He, he challenges us to doubt our salvation. Now fast forward. We're coming to the end of our journey as a follower of Jesus. The devil wants to trip us up because if he can, he can discredit all the good we did for all of those years. That's why Paul said, I want to finish this race with joy. So it's a good thing to know that God will be with us and give us the strength we need to finish the race we need to run. So Jesus is saying, look, I'm going to die on the cross and there's no getting around this. Such important revelation in this discussion between Jesus and his disciples Pastor Greg Laurie is presenting a message called Lost in Translation today here on A New Beginning, and there's more to come. Pastor Greg pointed out that it was always God's plan for Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. He paid for your sins and mine, but we need to come to Him for that forgiveness of sin. Have you ever done that? Pastor Greg, if someone wants to make that decision— They can do that today, can't they? They can, and it's so simple. And I think because it's so simple, people think, oh, it can't be that easy. Well, look, Jesus did all the heavy lifting. He carried the cross for you. He died on that cross that he carried. This isn't about what you do. It's about what he's done. But here's what the Bible says. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You say, well, okay, how do I do that? You do it through prayer. And if you pray this prayer after me, I believe God will hear it and answer it, and Christ will come to live inside of you. So if you want Jesus to come into your life and forgive you of your sin, if you want to know that you'll go to heaven when you die, if you want to fill that big hole in your heart, pray these words if you would. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin. I am sorry for my sin, and I turn from it now. And I choose to follow you from this moment forward. Be my Savior and my Lord. Be my God and my friend. Thanks for hearing this prayer and answering this prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen, if you just prayed that prayer, I want you to know that God has heard you and has answered it. The Bible says, these things we write to you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life that you may know it's yours now. God has given it to you because it's the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Congratulations and welcome to the family of God. Amen. Listen, would you let us help you get started living this new life? Let us send you Pastor Greg's New Believer's Bible. It's in an easy to understand translation with so many helps specifically for those who are new to the faith. We'll send it free of charge. So get in touch for your copy of the New Believer's Bible. Call us at 1-800-821-3300. We can take your call any time. That's 1-800-821-3300. Or write A New Beginning, Box 4000, Riverside, California, 92514. Or just go online to harvest.org and click the words, Know God. Well, we have Pastor Levi Lesko with us today. Levi is the lead pastor of Fresh Life Church in Montana, Wyoming, Oregon, and Utah, and throughout the universe online. And uh, he's been a good friend of ours for a long, long time. And he's got a brand new book. It's a devotional book, a devotional book for kids called Marvel at the Moon. You know, uh, Pastor Levi, parents often carry a lot of guilt about the time they spend leading their kids in devotions, you know, or lack of time. Uh, We all know the value of it, but life just gets busy and complicated. Uh, But your new book uh, makes that challenge a whole lot easier, does it not? Yeah, I'm really excited um, about it because I'm a dad, and I'm in the trenches with my kids every day trying to read the Bible, trying to point them to Jesus, and trying to have them stay interested, you know, and yeah, Getting those sure. three things together can be uh, a, a feat, um, but it's so precious and special and worth it at bedtime yeah. to open up Scripture, 
to engage their their mind. You know, studies have shown that if parents read to their kids and if kids see their parents reading, the chances are they'll go on to become readers themselves. Mm. And readers end up being leaders and leaders uh, are readers. And so it really is, it's a challenge, but it's worth it. And for me, as a children's author now, uh, I've tried to write kids' books that my kids would want to, st- and then they they do want to stay engaged in colorful photos, engaging pictures, um, scientific facts, but then also, most importantly, spiritual truth that will anchor their hearts on heaven. That's great insight from Pastor Levi Lusco, talking about his new book, Marvel at the Moon: Ninety Devotions for Kids Based on Outer Space. I think your kids are going to really like this. And that's why we're offering it to you for your gift of any size to our ministry. And when you send that gift in, and I ask you to be generous, we use that to continue this ministry. You know, we want to reach people of all ages. And all the time I get letters from not only older folks who listen, but they tell me the little ones listen as well. And so this is a devotion that is going to be great for the kids. Marvel at the Moon by Levi Lusco. Dave, tell them how they can order a copy. Yeah, it's easy to do. Just get in touch with us and mention that title, Marvel at the Moon. We're sending it to say thank you for partnering with us so we can continue to bring Pastor Greg's teaching each day here on A New Beginning. Call us anytime, night or day, at 1-800-821-3300. That's 1-800-821-3300. Or write A New Beginning, Box 4000, Riverside, California, 92514. Or go online to harvest.org. What is the cross we have to bear in following Christ? Pastor Greg says it may not be what you think it is. Good clarification coming next time as our study called Lost in Translation continues. Join us here on A New Beginning with pastor and Bible teacher Greg Laurie. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to A New Beginning. This is a podcast made possible by Harvest Partners. So for more content that can help you know God and equip you to make Him known to others or to learn more about how you can become a Harvest Partner, just go to harvest.org.